Well, there's two kinds of digitization taking place in agriculture. Uh, one kind is the one people would expect, I suppose, which is that it's uh, sensors, it's artificial intelligence, it's uh, um, robots and so on that, that are now uh, programmed in a way that, that uh, they can automatically do many chores or they can gather information yeah, about crop yield or about fertilizer use or something like that. So the people kind of assume that that's the major thrust of digitization in agriculture. The, the, uh, the, the, the internet of things, in the sense of turning everything in the field into, into inf digital information. And, and that's much more dramatic, perhaps, though, than people realize. But the second area of digitization is around genomics. It's around the actual biology of, of the livestock and the crops in the field and the fish in the, in, the, in the oceans, which are also being, in a sense, monitored digitally, but also being altered uh, in their DNA. So it's the di digitization of DNA, of the double helix, of the A, C, G, and T of, of DNA. So it's those two fields, and it's those two fields when they come together. So in fact, you have uh, the same computer managing both the, the biology of the crop in the field, and the same computer is also managing the, the, the harvesting tractors and, and so on in the field as well. The implications are, are, or the relevancy to agriculture is huge because almost everything that, that uh, in digital information is, is, uh, has an impact on agriculture. But it, it, its impacts probably come out in a couple of very specific ways. One of them is that the ability to control vast amounts of information mean that some of the links in, this, in the food chain from, from the seed through to the fertilizers and the, the farm machinery to the to the um, uh, grain trading companies, the food trading companies, through to the processors and the retailers, all those links in the chain can be linked much more tightly than before because of digital information. And it means that there can be mergers now between companies at different ends of the food chain that would, we would never would have thought of before. And they can make profits and they can make connections that we would never would have expected before. And the second kind of, of, of impact is, is really that scale no longer has the same relevance that it used to have. So whereas before, big companies wanted to work with big crops, uh, big fields, big amounts of livestock, large fishery projects, uh, now they don't really care if it's big or small. The digital controls allow them to adjust their, their algorithms uh, to manage the, any size of production. And that might sound good, but frankly the risk there is that it, it means that, that it's possible for them to reach in and control peasant production around the world and decide what happens to peasant crops and peasant land. We always have this, this, this assumption, we have had all my life at least, that, that there is a, a quick fix to all of our problems, that there's a technological fix to our problems. So when we were concerned about overpopulation and hunger in the 1950s and 1960s and 1970s, the solution was the Green Revolution. We will simply produce high yielding semi-dwarf crops and that will take care of the problem. And we produce that for, for maize and for wheat and for rice and don't worry. Or we have the solution in the 1980s and the 1990s, which was that don't worry, biotechnology, genetically modified crops will take care of world hunger. So relax, it's done. And then we have the solution that uh, now that there's another generation of biotechnology, which is the, the, uh, the, again, digital DNA. And we have this idea that we can sort of automate everything, all of the information, so that we can have a much more efficient food system and solve the problems of world hunger and solve the problems of, of, of pollution in, in, in agriculture with a new app of some kind. So we go from agriculture to apiculture in a way. And, and I think that naivety scares me, that we, we keep reaching for these instant easy answers as though technologies were disembodied from reality and they just come in and solve our problems for us. Well, they didn't solve the problems in the 1950s or 60s, not in the 70s or 80s with biotechnology, not now. And we have to realize that there's a context for the technology, and, that techno and even though we might like some parts of the technology, and I can love some parts of the technology, in fact, even though it's fascinating and interesting and potentially useful, if it's in the wrong context, it won't work to the advantage of those who are hungry or those who want good food or those who are overnourished, they will still suffer. 
So that, that is, you know, there's a naivety, I guess, around this idea that, that, that don't worry, science will come in and save the day. So, so the policymakers don't actually have to think anymore. <laughs>